talk about my journey with leadership. Um, so we're going to see some photos here, some of which might be a little cute. Some of you have been, you know, probably have never seen, many of you haven't seen these photos of me, because uh, anyone else out of my house has seen you. But. So I want to tell you where it starts. And it starts with me as uh -oh. a baby. Apparently, <laughs> I had plans. And uh, they maybe weren't good plans, but I was going to execute on them. I was fearless, I was adventurous, I was curious, and it started early. My dad told the story of when I was five, my sister was two, we were uh, in San Antonio at the Marriott, I think my dad was at a dental convention, and somehow I uh, duped my mom and took my sister and we went off to explore the hotel, and uh, hours later we were discovered by housekeeping in the basement, and I, I apparently got in the service elevator and it got all the way down there. Uh, so I'm sure my mom was freaking out, but anyway, that's how it began, and I believe I never really slowed down in terms of having that drive and wanting to uh, take risks and do interesting things to me. Um, my next chapter is in the Boy Scouts, and uh, I'm the one here in the middle holding the Philmont sign. This is on for 12 here, so pre-Team Marty. And um, Boy Scouts, for those that don't, you don't know, um, they train their boys to lead. The boys actually run their groups, they run their patrols and their troops. So 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds are put in charge of running these outings and all these activities. And so at this young age, I was trained, at least at some level, to be a leader. I don't know how good of a leader I really was. I don't have that good memory of that, but I was put in charge of things. And so it went on. The next chapter was me after high school in the Army, and I, uh, much to the chagrin of my parents and some of my friends, I decided not to go to college and join the Army instead. I was not a leader in the Army, though. I was a supply man. I followed orders and was part of a large team, and so uh, it was a very good experience. I didn't always agree with the orders I was given, uh, but I recognized the value of the team and the value of that structure and strong leadership. And all those experiences started to build my sort of understanding and beliefs around leadership and how that can help uh, things go forward. The next chapter is sort of the um, uh, not unexpected chapter, and that was being a parent. Um, I would learn more about leadership and about leading folks and dealing with adversity and challenges and surprises as a parent. And with my current uh, sort of roles and various leadership positions that Jeff is alluding to, uh, I've drawn more on what I've done to be a good dad uh, to be effective there. So we already have a little bit of uh, introduction Jeff uh, did on these things. These are the things that I do now, and they all have some form of uh, I mean, the formal role of running. Uh, Hot Clippers Convention, I've been running that for 13 years as a business owner. And so many challenges running a small business uh, as a software consultancy. So not only am I working with entrepreneurs and businesses to uh, rescue their software, build software in a new way, you know, ship their products. I'm also dealing with you know the internal struggles of teams and communication and just solving business problems internally. Like how you know I made so many mistakes with Hackerworks over the years, and I learned that I adapted. And so, so many lessons came from that. We had Boulder Ruby, which actually originally was the Boulder Denver Ruby group, because I felt bad that Denver didn't have any, any group, so I tried to split it, and I realized that wasn't going to work so well. Uh, and then I, I picked Boulder only. Uh, luckily, Derailed started shortly after Boulder Ruby started, so uh, that was nice that um, Fernand and those guys were able to run Derailed for so many years. Uh, but that's, again, a small, small organization of Amita, which I still run, so it's been 13 years, actually, Boulder Ruby's been going on. And then Ruby Central, it's a big nonprofit uh, where we run RailsConf and RubyConf, and there's different leadership challenges uh, that are involved there. And finally, Boy Scouts, I am an adult a volunteer uh, with my son's troop in Boy Scouts, and actually this uh, weekend on Sunday, I did their leadership training for the boys, next round of boys, anyway, leadership. So I think a lot about leadership, and I think about it in a lot of different ways. So the question is, what is a leader? And we can look at the dictionary here, hope it works. Uh, and this is uh, fine, but this isn't really a very useful definition. It's a little too broad for my taste. We 
we can certainly look at some iconic leaders, and you can see that they come from all different kinds of backgrounds. Some of them are in very formal positions, like their political leaders or their military leaders, but some of them are just, they started a movement, and they're going to make it happen. No one put them in charge. They just took, uh, took lead and made it happen. And so leadership can happen really anywhere. We have some other examples that are perhaps <laughs> iconic, but maybe you're not the ones that want to emulate. And maybe, I suspect we could all argue that they aren't really leaders. These are managers that, are, that we are forced to follow or at least deal with avoid or whatnot. Um, and so it, it does, you know, really bring up the point that just because someone has been hired as manager, just because they've been put in charge of a group of people, doesn't really make them a leader. So what is leadership? And here's a uh, definition or explanation that I found recently that I really like that we're going to come explore briefly. So the first part that I like to highlight is that it's a process of social influence. But this process isn't really defined, it's not limited. So it could be like you're given authority, you're given a role, and you're, you have to give folks orders or whatnot, sure, but that's true. But it could be any sort of influence. It could come from, you know, like you're just leading from behind, or you're helping out uh, your group in various ways. And these are all forms of process or social influence. The next piece here is that it maximizes the efforts of others. And so, by introducing the efforts of others, we're talking about a team, we're talking about a group, and that your effort, your point of your leadership is that you're maximizing, you're trying to make the group stronger, make it better, make it produce more, whatever is important to that group, you're maximizing whatever it's doing. And that there are lots of ways you can accomplish this. Finally, there is a goal, we're working towards something. Leadership has some direction, and this is important that we not only uh, sort of acknowledge this goal, but we keep it in mind as we uh, decide what we're going to do. So, as we sort of kind of come to this conclusion, you know, to be a leader, you have to earn it. It's not something that just can be given to you. You're not, not really a leader at that point. And we're going to talk a little bit today about what that means. There are many paths to leadership. Certainly, my path uh, was that I had this great drive and curiosity of the world and I was just going to make it happen. Whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, it didn't really matter. I was going to make it happen. And that's been true for most of my life. Luckily, uh, as my experiences grew over the years, I got a little wiser and smarter about some of the things that I did. And I can tell you that looking back at different points in my life, I shake my head like, really? I did that? What was I thinking? And so for each of you, your path to leadership might look completely different. It doesn't need to look like anybody else's. It doesn't have to have that formal route. It doesn't have to have this, I was born to be a leader kind of thing. It can come to it in different ways. So what I'm curious to explore is what does this look like in software? Let's be a little more concrete, a little more specific. This is a quick list I put together. This is not meant to be definitive. Uh, there can be some other things to be here. But when I think about a technical leader, these are some of the things that I think they're going to be doing. The first piece is kind of like probably the obvious one that we would that we would think about is that you actually know how to build software. And that could be actually writing code, that's how you make sort of like high level architecture and design, how you go about communicating with your team and the process which you go through to build your software and ship it and maintain it and all that. So there is this knowledge piece that we know what we're doing actually with software. The second piece is they make technical technical decisions. So, yep, yep, we expect a leader to do that. Now, they, they don't have to always be the one that makes it. It can be sort of driven by a group uh, process, but ultimately they're responsible for those technical decisions happening. There's this communication piece here. Communication is pretty important to teams. And we're talking internally, so how does the team work together? But also outside the team. So, like, how do we work with users? How do we work with uh, business interests? How do we work with external providers and services that we need? All these things are important, especially if you're doing anything complex where there's lots of coordination, that communication becomes even more important. And thus, the technical leader needs to own this piece. Mentoring others, I think this is a one that certainly this community has embraced, and now when I look out there at the greater software community, mentoring is a very common term that we hear. Certainly when I got started doing this in the 90s, I don't think I ever heard mentoring ever mentioned when I was doing software. I, it, I mean, it happened in a way, but it wasn't uh, spoken about. It wasn't something that we uh, we actively did. And then finally, that's a good example. And I think this is all 
true. So what's interesting, though, about this slide, if you really look at all those five points, what if this wasn't a leader? What if this is just a teammate of yours? Wouldn't you want that person in your team? The answer is yes, or at least I would say yes. These are fantastic. And so the thing is, you can have leaders at all different levels in your software groups, in your teams, and they don't have to actually be in a formal position. So one question that I get um, fairly often is, Marty, what's the difference between a senior and a mid-level developer? And not that I intend for this slide to be definitive advisor, so that's a very uh, sort of complex, nuanced, and a lengthy discussion. It could be easily talked on its own. We'd probably make a conference on it if we wanted to. And, uh, but these are some of the things that stand out for me. So one of the things is I don't have, I don't have to tell a senior what to do. I do have to give them some direction, like here is what I want you to accomplish, like here's this component I'd like you to build, here's the system I'd like you to design, here is this team that I want you to kind of work with. There is some sort of like, here's your mission. But I'm not going to go in and tell them how to go about doing that. I know they know how to do it. I trust them to do it and do it right. I don't have to babysit them. It's great. Uh, I know they'll work effectively as a team. They have that experience. That they can do that. And then if an issue comes up, and they always do, they'll be able to handle it. This, to me, is some of the biggest separation that I see between a senior developer and a mid-level developer. And so when I look at these different points, I see them as uh, examples of leadership or lack of leadership. So a senior developer, at some level, has developed these leadership capacity that they now use to do their job. So, we're now going to transition into talking about how you, as an individual contributor, as a junior programmer, wherever you are in your journey, how you can do some of these things. The things that you can use to cultivate those skills and become more of a leader before you're given that position, before you're ever put in that place. The first piece is you lead by understanding. We are knowledge workers. What we know, our know-how, is so crucial to what we do in our job. So understanding and, and knowing what we're going to be doing is key. So the first piece here is knowing the purpose. What is the goal of your team? Your product, your business, sort of what is your what are the goals your users might have? What do they want from your software? Do you know these things? If you don't, you need to find out. You should ask. And then once you have that, it's going to guide your work. So many times, daily, right, we make like tiny decisions about how to implement something, how to design something, how, what's your approach you take on the software you're building. If you don't have answers to these things, if you don't have that bigger picture, you're going to be working in a vacuum. You're not going to know whether you should go this way or that way. And so many times, when I've seen over the years where we might be given a task, you know, a business owner is asked for feature a certain way. And maybe they didn't think about it. And, and a senior or myself or someone will catch it and say, wait a minute, this doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, I thought the purpose or the goal of what we're trying to accomplish is this. This seems to cross purposes with that goal. And so that sometimes will be asked these things. If you don't have this big picture, you can't be effective there. Know yourself. Uh, we've already touched on this uh, today. I love the, the feedback piece earlier with Katrina and the questions. And this is this is pretty important. Um, we do a lot of apprenticeship stuff with Paco Works, and I've done a lot of mentoring over the years. And uh, one piece I've noticed is that oftentimes these juniors come in and they really don't have a good sense of where they are. They might think they're more they're further along than where they are, or they might actually uh, be very down on their own abilities and doubt them. And so really getting a good bearing of where you are is super important. So here are some things that you can do to sort of build this self-awareness, that you can now have a better sense of yourself, because you're going to be beating this. Uh, you have to be honest with yourself also. You know, it's OK. Like, I've gotten to a point in my life where I'm old enough to, like, I am who I am, and I accept that I have faults. We all do. And I don't have that bluster that I had in my 20s where I thought it was just hot shit and just amazing. And the reality came around and I realized, oh, okay, yeah, maybe not so much. But, you know, you need to get to this place where you're okay with this. 
You need to have that time for self-reflection. You know, go and learn about cognitive bias. There's all these ways that we maybe put on sort of blinders. We're not aware of what's around us and how we're interacting with the world. And this is very important to how you can grow and become a better person and a better uh, developer and leader. The flip side is knowing your team, the people around you. We're all different. We all have different values, how we want to work, communicate, how we learn. If you don't know how to interact or relate to your fellow teammates, you're not going to be very effective in an interaction. So start pay, 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 paying attention to this sort of thing. I'm not so suggesting you like make dossiers on folks, but like you can certainly get to where like, oh, I know, like Andy loves to learn this way, right? When I talk to me, this is how we're going to sort of work through a problem, and I know she'll get that because that's how she likes to sort of communicate. And so sort of build up this awareness. I almost didn't put this in. Uh, I feel this is almost in the obvious category, but I do want to stress this that um, our industry moves so fast. How we built software 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is in many ways so radically different from how we work today. So you have to be continuously learning. Now I know for those of you that are in the Turing crowd, you have this sort of like lifetime learner model, and that's fantastic, that's exactly what we're kind of going at here. But here are some of the things that you really need to stay on top of. You need to understand the trade-offs of all the technologies, tools, and processes you use because there are trade-offs. There's nothing, there's no silver bullets. There's nothing like, yep, we're always using Ruby, or we're always using whatever. Like, you just haven't seen enough to know better. But there are trade-offs, and you have to understand what those trade-offs are. You also need to broaden your knowledge so that when new technologies come along, or new methodologies, or wherever they are, that you can evaluate them as well. You can, you can have intelligent conversations with your team, with you know, manager or whatever about why we should go in this direction, why we should uh, sort of advocate for use of this new technology or not. If you don't have this, then you can't be part of that conversation. So the ability for us to make decisions hinges on what we know. It's very important. So these are all the different ways you go about that. And um, it's going to be the foundation of, that you're going to be using in your work. And uh, sort of as uh, sort of a wise lesson I got from, from 80s Saturday morning cartoons, Knowing is half the battle. Lead by example. All right, so this is probably something that you, you've heard countless times. Well, of course, leaders lead by example, and it's true. It's actually very important that this is uh, indeed how we are. And we want to start off with talking about how actions matter. And you need to model the behavior and the value you expect for your group. And you can do this when you're just beginning out on a team, when you're just new to a team or like you've been there maybe a year, you don't have to be a senior to do this. You can, you can identify what is the, the behavior, the values, and the way of working that's important to this team or to me personally. And you model that. You make sure that you're accountable for how you are here because it's going to be the basis of which you're going to set your example and influence your team. Acting with integrity. Uh, this kind of follows up with that. Uh, you can't really fool people on your team. You know, if you're not, if you can't really walk the walk, if you want, don't really, if you aren't authentic, they're gonna totally tell. And what's worse is they're not gonna trust you. They're not going to respect you. They won't want to work with you as much. And that's not a good place to be, especially if you want to be a positive influence on your team. So act with integrity. I would say that. Most of us have this drive to deliver quality, but you might not have a purposeful way of going about it. And I think that if you want to sort of step up to the next level, be that example, sort of uh, lift up your team, you need to definitely deliver quality. You need to have these high standards, and you need to strive for excellence. Now, this is, uh, you know, like how would you go about doing this? Well, one of the concepts that I love you haven't heard about it, it's called Kaizen. It is a Japanese philosophy of continuous improvement. It comes from the Toyota production systems of the 50s, so lean manufacturing, if you've heard that term. And Kaizen is this idea, it's got, got two parts, but one's a philosophical part, and one's sort of the uh, action part. The phil philosophical part is that you have this culture where you're actively engaged, you're looking for ways to constantly improve and make suggestions and make everything better around the way you work. So all, all the way 
point to where this becomes your way of thinking. And I myself personally, um, I, I, this is just how I've been a long time. So when I finally came around to uh, seeing Kaizen, I'm like, this is awesome. This is exactly what I love. And, and sort of, if you ever want to become a better person, you have this personal growth you want to go through, this is, you're going to be doing Kaizen for yourself. So what does that look like? In action, this is what they call, it's pretty straightforward. It's sort of a very scientific method, if you will. Uh, they call it the uh, Kaizen event. Uh, but it has really kind of four basic steps. Plan, do, check, and act. And so the idea here is, of course, you, you plan out what are you, what are you trying to prove? Like, what's your approach to that? Great, okay, cool. Now you do the thing. It's not quite like drawing the owl, but it's similar. And then, then check. So you have to measure, like, did it actually move the needle? Did it actually make any improvements? You have to evaluate. This is very data-centric. You want to see results. And then finally, you adjust and repeat as necessary. And um, Lean Startup, if you're familiar with that, also has a similar kind of feedback loop where they're constantly doing this build learn loop where they're, they're uh, iterating very quickly over, over their software or their process to make it better. So all this kind of comes from the same source. The thing I would say here is that uh, don't underestimate how important setting this example uh, of how to be and that you're growing, you're getting better, is going to be on your team. And the other piece that to kind of say here is that uh, people are going to notice. They're going to say, wow, so-and-so is really just kicking ass. This is great. Like, they're going to see this. And it's going to start to snowball on you where you're going to get you know, better and better. And you're going to just all of a sudden get these promotions. It'll be awesome. So I do want to stress this. It's really important. It's part, important part of becoming and fostering these leadership skills. This next piece is falls into sort of the intangible category, I will. This is kind of the, uh, I hear like, go the extra mile kind of sort of phrases and whatnot. This is kind of this area. Um, and I grouped this first one as sort of nothing gets missed. And this is the idea that, uh, especially if you're doing any sort of uh, event or sort of complex process with a lot going on, it's very easy for those that are planning to miss something. Uh, to not realize that a step hadn't been done or hadn't been assigned to someone. And this is the idea that you're looking out for those sort of things. And you're being proactive. You're not waiting for someone to assign it to you, to tell you to do this. But you're going to say, hey, I noticed that this thing needs to be done. And I'm either going to communicate about it. So, hey, look, folks, this, are we going to do this? Are we skipping it? Or I'm just going to knock this out. This is that idea. Uh, this, and this is not the not my job thing. Like, oh, I can't do that. It's not, I'm not approved to do that. So, I'm sorry. Pass the buck, and someone else is going to do that for you. My cat just drives me bonkers if you get that over and over again. So this is not that. And also here, I put this, no job is beneath you. Like, if, it, if you see the floor needs to be swept, you know what? I'll just grab a broom and I'll do it. Like, I don't mind. I'll roll my sleeves. I don't care if I'm the boss. I will do whatever job it takes to get it done because that's what leaders do. And that helps the group succeed, is that we make sure we don't miss something. Being autonomous, uh, this is, uh, might be a little obvious, but this is something that I want you to work towards if you're not there yet. This is sort of kind of like, now I know I'm a senior almost kind of thing, but this is the idea that you don't need someone else to direct you. That once you've been given enough uh, of, uh, like, here's your task type information, that you can be self-reliant, that you can now go through and get whatever you've been assigned done. Uh, and I, I say here, earn your reputation where the team knows you'll deliver. Well, if you assign so-and-so, that's going to happen. I know it will happen, and it'll be done well. That's where you want to get to. So this isn't a lone wolf mindset. This doesn't mean that you're like, yep, I got this. Nobody, I'm not going to talk to anyone. I'm going to go off my own and, and knock it out. It's not that. You still keep a team first mentality, but that you don't need others to make sure you do your job right or that you get it done. So still, still fine to ask for help, and I just suggest that that's the case, but you want to get to where you are self-reliant for what you do. Oftentimes when um, I am uh, sort of talking with other leaders and other people, managers, they, these are all the kinds of things that they, they look for. And I've noticed over the years that the really good employees, the ones that I feel comfortable putting more tasks on, are the ones that do these sort of intangible pieces. So you want to be that. Lead by lifting others. So this is the idea that you can maximize
optimize your team, you can help your team by helping them out. So here is this look to help concept. This is if you're, you're keeping your eyes out for ways that you can help if someone's struggling. I've got some examples here. You know, maybe you share some tip or approach, some script that you've, you've adopted that's really making a difference, making you more productive. This is the share mentality. So that you're trying to, anything good that you've sort of come across that helps you do better in your job, that you're, you're, you're building that out to your teammates. They're going down the wrong path. They've got obstacles in the way that you can help out with. Because there are ways you can help. And that helps your team. The next piece is mentoring. Teaching is fantastic. I think we've kind of already established this. It's probably already, you've heard a lot about mentoring. But it's super important that this is something that you can do. And you can do it even when you're starting off. Because you don't have to be a senior to uh, give back and mentor in some ways. And actually, with my apprenticeship and, and uh, things at Hot Code Works, some of the best mentoring interaction that I saw was when uh, sort of an early mid and our advanced junior was working with another junior. It's just fantastic. So I, uh, I, I encourage you all to look for any opportunities where you can mentor with that as a part of your practice. So even though, um, it, you know, even though you might not be in a leadership role, even though it might not be your job, certainly helping out and mentoring is something you can do from day one. So we've talked a little bit about communication and how important is the team. And this is something that uh, I see as a real difference maker for folks getting started. Uh, because in our work, uh, understanding what we're building, understanding what other people are doing is really important, and communication is how you arrive at that understanding. So it's a cornerstone of effective teams. Um, I do want to stress here this uh, idea that you practice empathy uh, through your communication. And uh, we'll get to uh, feedback in just a bit, but like this idea that you are aware of how you're talking, the words you're using, how you're relating to your, uh, your teammates or whoever you're working with, and are you being empathetic in terms of that? Uh, there, there's a lot to, to go into there. I won't get into any specifics, but this is something that you want to think about when you're communicating. How empathetic are you being? Listening to learn is, uh, is a great way of thinking about when you're, you're taking in information. And uh, I think um, I think it was uh, Katrina that was mentioning this, that, that uh, with TV, the international TV, the PR, like, oh, that's curious. Instead of like, I can't believe she said I did that wrong, you're like, oh, that's interesting. Why? I wonder why I would go that, or why would I do that one piece, or why would I write the code that way? And this is the same idea here, is that you're hearing something, you're taking in information, and maybe it doesn't make sense, but you should be sort of like a detective and find out what is that, why? Why is it different? Why am I reacting? You know, what can I learn from this? Over-communication piece um, is something that um, I, I, we do quite a bit with hot code words. We're a distributed team, so we're not physically together anywhere. And so we stress this over-communication piece where we're always communicating. We're using different method, methods for communicating and that everything is available out there, so if someone is not uh, around, when a conversation happens, they can get to a lot of that information. And so if you are remote or if you're on site, you need to think about how well are you communicating? Are, are things being siloed or being only discussed at the water cooler, or are they only happening in certain meetings and the rest of the group isn't aware of it? So you as an individual contributor can make sure that you're really communicating and everyone's clear about what you're doing and you're understanding what they're doing and what's happening. So, so we'll talk about feedback. It is a gift. It is a really important way that teams improve. And uh, I was uh, just tickled when uh, Jeff went the feedback around on the questions. So we're going to talk a little bit about that now. So here's the thing. If feedback, both in how it's given and received, is done right, it can be very, very powerful. It can be very uh, inspiring and motivating for your team. If it's not done well, you can imagine that can be destructive to relationships. It can uh, kill morale. It can create distrust. And so uh, it's, it's important that you think about how you give feedback. Um, criticizing private. I just want to put that in there that, that, that you should never be criticizing publicly. That's a uh, risk of shaming. And that's not going to be conducive to what you want. So giving feedback. 
Uh, here's a little acronym that I like to uh, recommend that's sort of a little framework for how you can give feedback effectively. And it's called ask. The first piece here is that it's actionable. You should have an outcome in mind. What exactly are you trying to accomplish by giving this feedback? What do you expect is going to happen with this feedback? Specific. It should be concrete and be detailed. If you get into a generalized, I'm just, uh, you know, you know, you always do this or whatever, like that's exaggeration. Probably not true. Also, that's a lot more of a, a tactic, sort of a tactic that you're using there. You can definitely hear when someone says something like that, that there's sort of a wounding or some sort of issue, frustration they have internally, and they're now letting that come out. So be specific. It's pretty hard to argue when you get off specifics about this happened on this day, these things happened, and this was the outcome of that. And so let's talk about what we can do um, to make that better. And then finally, kind. There's lots of ways you can give us feedback. You can be tactful. You can still give them the feedback. You can still, still say, like, this wasn't good, this was bad, or this was, this was harmful, or whatever it might be. You can say that in a way where they know that you care and that you are being kind in how you deliver it. That makes it a little bit easier for that feedback to be received. So on the other side, we have receiving feedback. So the first piece here is this self-awareness. You have to be ready. If someone's giving you feedback, and we're going to assume this feedback is probably critical. If they're giving positive feedback, that's going to be like, oh, I don't know if I can take this good feedback. But, you know, I, there, there is, we're talking probably about critical stuff. And... You want to hear this, though. You have to get to a place where you're okay with this. And here's the thing about a lot of this, is that it's not necessarily about you. Almost all this stuff is about your actions. It's about the things that you've done. And that doesn't mean that intrinsically you can't do better, that you can't be different, because you can. That's one of the most amazing things about us as humans, is we're so adaptable, we can grow. The way that I was when I was much younger is so different from where I am now. And I'd see it with my kids, I'd see it with so many people. So as long as they're willing to do the work and strive, they can get to where they can make it better. So if someone tells you something's not good or you're, you know, you messed up, you want to hear that. Because if you don't hear it, guess what? You're going to keep doing it. And people are going to know. They're going to be like, oh, that's that, that, you know, he always does this, she always does this, and, you know, life's, you know, whatever. Um, I'm, I'm going to give up on that person because I don't think that they'll ever change. Well, you have to you have to receive that feedback for that to be possible. So again, we have a nice acronym, ACT. <clears throat> First piece is accept, and there's a lot to this. I'm going to be fairly brief, but there's body language. You can tell it's like, look, I'm ready to receive feedback from you. I, I'm interested. I, I want to hear what you have to say. It might be painful, but I'm open to that. And so you want to show in, in body language and your demeanor and everything you can. If you have to fake it, that's fine, but like, do your best. Clarify. Um, I'm going to plug active listening. Come on, that's a, you look this up on your own time kind of thing. I, I don't have the time to go into active listening. But active listening is a technique you can use when you're taking in feedback that allows you to really fully understand and, and, and be able to take that in and, and put to action. And I think the thing that, that I think Jeff, you guys touched on earlier was that, you know, if someone is going to the effort to give you this, no, we're assuming they're not an asshole and they're just me, but if they're, if they're doing this in a uh, trying to help you out really way, they're not narcissistic or whatever, then um, there's some truth to what they're saying. So in their reality, their perception, their viewpoint is valid. And so you need to take it in. It may not be your viewpoint, and it may not be true all the time, but it is at least true in this one instance. And that you should think about that and think is this, you know, maybe that's more true for more folks. Take it in. And finally, you think you thank them for providing valuable feedback. Now, what you do with this feedback is a totally different matter, and uh, you don't necessarily always have to act on it, but it's good to take it in and then reflect on it. Uh, I like to plug a book called Radical Candor, and um, I love this graph, I love the quadrants here. And uh, what we're talking about with this giving and receiving feedback really kind of falls in the radical candor uh, category where you care personally, but you're willing to challenge directly. You're willing to give them that tough feedback and say, this is how you didn't do so well or whatever it is. Something is probably uncomfortable. This is not going to be an awesome conversation, but it's one that needs to happen if we're going to grow and things are going to get better. 
And so that's this, this uh, quadrant up there, radical candor. Um, the one I want to highlight here, the other one, is luminous empathy. And this is where you care personally about someone, but you're not willing to, to challenge directly. You're not willing to have those hard conversations. And so that's kind of like letting them walk around with like mustard in their shirt. They don't know. You know, embarrassed. Like, oh, my God. I'm going to hurt their feelings yet. We're, their, their feelings are already hurt, but they never realize that they're acting like an ass or whatever it might be. No one's willing to challenge them. So, rudeness and things actually the worst of all the four. So, the, the thing we'll say here, and I'm kind of wrap, wind, winding down here of the talk, is that uh, this isn't easy. I'm not suggesting that this is going to be something you're going to knock out in like a month from now. You're going to get all figured out. I'm, I'm, I'm badass now. Um, it's not going to be that at all. It's going to take time and effort. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't personally, I'm not sure how long it took me to do a lot of this work, but it's been many years. You do need to be intentional. You need to, you need to set out a plan and start working on this. And I would just say take it a step at a time. Don't try to do this all at once. Pick some area and start working on that. Put it to practice. Make sure you're getting it down and move on. So, like, if you could hop into a DeLorean and, like, would fly your way back to, like, the 80s and see, like, Teenage Marty or the 20s and see Marty back then in the 90s or whatnot, you know, it, it would have been rough. I, uh, uh, I've grown so much of those years, and, and it's, it's something that, that we all have this journey where we're at this point in our journey, and we want to go there. We're going to have to put the hard work to get there, and be easy on yourself. You know, give yourself space to grow and get better, uh, but you can do it. And the thing that I, uh, when I, when I was kind of thinking about all of this, this talk, I realized, you know what, like, being a good leader is actually just being a good human. Like, whether you're in a leadership position or not, if you're doing all those things, that's awesome. Like, everyone's going to, like, want you to be on their team and be around you because you're going to let them up with so many positive things about doing all this work. It may be really hard, but it is totally worth it. So, in closing, I just want to say, you don't need a title. You don't need to be in a management position to do this thing. You can be a leader now. Thank you. Question, and I was thinking about Marty. Uh, there's a saying or a like, rule of thumb kind of in startup world, small company world, that the company takes on the characteristics of the founding team. Right? The yes. that tends to be their strengths yep. and weaknesses. Do you think that plays out in teams within the larger company? Like, does does the team of eight developers led by one person does as a team does it tend to work like that leader? Yes, absolutely. I've seen this to be true. I think that um, uh, certainly my own teams they probably there's a they're pulled a little more towards the Marty direction and how they interact um, and. For, for uh, better or worse, that's true. Uh, I've I've worked with a lot of different um, teams, and organizations over the years, where those that were in charge clearly set the pattern. They set like a sort of energetic template of like this is like what we expect. These are the values. This is how we're going to work. And so people just sort of like they pick it up and they, they just kind of they fall. Either they they fight it and they leave. It's bloody or it's rough. Or they adapt and they're like, okay, I'll just fall in line and I'll be like I'm supposed to be here. So I think it's definitely true. Related, there's a idea I keep thinking about in it, like the growth of teams, where uh, again, like I think that was kind of said or plays out frequently or whatever. That if you have a top level leader, a CEO, head of the company, whatever, then they're second tier right under them. That most often the successor CEO does not come from the second tier, it comes from the third tier, because the second tier is set up to like compensate for the weaknesses essentially of the leader, and the third tier is really where there's like the same kind of entrepreneurial spirit or like leadership characteristics and so forth. Like I'm curious, have you seen that play out and particularly in your work with uh, kind of parachuting into other companies in their growth cycle. What, when, when, you, when you jump in, like, what are the things you observe in these small, like, high-growth companies? Yeah, so I think certainly there is um, sort of following the, the patterns that the individuals set up. 
terms where if there, there is a, this is how we communicate, these are the codependencies that we create about how we work together and how we're successful together. And so that can create, you can think of it as like sort of like a people coupling that uh, they, get, they get comfortable with. And so if there needs to be a lot of change, they have to break that up, like, or, or, or it won't work. Like they won't, they won't change, they won't adapt well because this is how we've worked, this has worked for us, we don't really want to change, we don't want to, and that, that's tough. And I think uh, certainly I temper how aggressive I am when I have a client that comes in and they've got a big mess in their hands. And a lot of times when there's a rescue, it's, it's not technical in nature, right? It's not, I mean, yeah, there might be some shitty code, there might be some bad design, you might have hired some folks that really were in over their heads. That's, that's all true generally, or can be true in a lot of cases. But it's really how they communicate, how the process they use, how they think about software, what they value. Those are all not in alignment with really what they want. They'll say, it, like, I want these things, but in reality, like, that's not what's happening on the ground. And so it, it does happen, and you just have to see what they're willing to change. Sometimes they are, you know, um, sometimes they're not. And it's like, you have to deliver the bad news, you know. I'm, I'm pretty vocal about that. Uh, a friend from the software world would always say, I've never seen a project fail for technical reasons. There it is, you know. And it's just, you see it play out over and over, even when it, even when the technical reasons get the blame, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, no. Like, and I wonder if it's just, like, the technical problems can typically be solved. The human problems are at least harder, and so it's, like, easier to blame. Oh, if we had chosen this different language or framework or whatever. Do you see, like, when you're, when you're jumping in and talking to companies, like, do they understand that? Are they blaming the technology and the choices? Or do they understand it's like, oh, I've seen a team. mix. I've seen a mix for sure. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's they just it's lots of little poor decisions stacked one after another that kind of adds up. And there's definitely a like, well, I guess we're here now. This is sort of how we build software, this is the quality we're willing to hear, or am I getting the time to do what I want to do? And you know, they're, they're sort of like a just they just accept this is reality and they kind of give up. That's kind of sad. I understand it though because if the organization's fighting you, your spirit's going to be crushed when, when you know, you're like, but I want to do all these things. I've been told this is how you build software and I want this, and they're like, oh, no. Just like that. I was talking with a friend um, who joking, like you know, when somebody says something that they they frame it like a joke, but you can tell they're not joking, and. Yeah. Said that, um, he said, you know, people like you, being me, uh, have really put us in this predicament. And I was like, okay, say more. Where now we have all these people with a year, two years, three years experience, and they think they know all these things, and really, they don't know anything. Uh, it seems that there are more companies now who either choose to or have to like make use of people early in their career. Where 10 years ago, like if you went to just a, you just picked a random team, it didn't necessarily have folks who were a year in or two years in or whatever. The, the idea of like a junior developer is almost new within the last like five, eight years. Like there were always people, obviously some people had to enter somewhere, but even at that point they were, they had done degrees, they had been programming on their own for 10 years, they had their own little projects and all those things. Like is the path we're on sustainable to developing these junior people into mid-level people, mid-level people into senior level people? Um, that's a good question, and I think the answer is no. We're not quite there yet, but it's changing. I mean, I think probably a lot of you um, have seen that it's really hard to get that first job. Um, and that um, is tricky, and there's and you can see through like a lot of the things I've talked about, like with that senior dev portrait of, of course they want a senior dev, they just drop in, they don't have to worry about that other guy. A lot of these companies really aren't set up to take in juniors and help them get there. And I've seen, um, you know, I've hired a, a few sort of turn grads on their second job, and um, I think two of them had really bad experiences. And I don't, I think it's okay to have a bad experience. Before they came to you, or before they came to me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two bad jobs. 
No, it's, it's, and it's okay. I think it's okay to like go someplace and realize, yep, yeah, that's not what I want to do. I don't like a team like that. Now I know what question to ask in my next interview. So I think that that's all fine. You just don't want to stay too long. But the problem is that if you stay too long in a place that's doing it wrong, we'll say, and, and you know, it's probably a little harsh, but like it's setting up a lot of bad patterns where like we'll have these people come in and I'll be like, okay, we're going to learn a whole bunch of things about how to build software because these things you see modeled for you was not good. And that's not, like I can give you examples of how this way of building software is going to be better. You now see how if we follow this process, if this how we work together, that's actually going to be better for you and the team and everybody. And so I think that that there are a lot more companies now aware of this and more cautious and they're, they're thinking about how can they onboard people with little experience. Um, and I think that that's true. I do think back to your original point here is that um, certainly when I got started and back in the 90s, there was always people coming in and they, they, but they were not expected to do too much. I think now there's so much demand and there's companies so desperate to try to develop their team that they're like, let's just get this junior, put them in there, and then they're putting them into a position that they're not really set up to succeed. They're putting too much pressure on them and not enough mentoring and enough guidance, and that makes it worse. So I think that definitely the last 10 years, we're seeing that now, now that there's so many new people in the workforce. I mean, you guys have got a lot of good things going for you. You've got a really good example set, but you know these places don't, you know, there's a lot of companies that just build software in a terrible way. <laughs> so bad, so. <laughs> this will be my, my last question. Uh, it's a plan. Yes. Come back here for a question. Um, but my last question is like, do do you think a person can be underserved by only seeing the good examples? Like, is it dangerous in a way for someone to go into a job where things are done well and then not understanding the pressures, the pitfalls, the problems of what happens when it doesn't go well? I think there's some truth to that. There certainly is the idea that if you've never seen it done a different way, one, you might not, there might be, first of all, there's lots of different ways to do things that can work. So that, just because we have this one model that works really well doesn't mean there's not a model that's really, really close. And so if you've never seen any other different ways of working, then um, one, you're not, you probably won't have a good way of recognizing how we get from this terrible place and process and an approach to this good place, like it's just too big of a divide. Um, and I think there is value in like having those experiences and certainly consulting, by the way, um, gives you just, you, you start at hyper speed in terms of exposure to things, especially if you're, you're put into rescue legacy type projects with others that know what they're doing. Um, and I think that that gives you more of that knowledge about sort of what works and what doesn't work. You'll see it like, wow, yeah. We modeled the way of uploading images this way, and that really sucked. That was painful in this way, and now I know. It's not just because I saw a blog post that this is the one true way. It's like I saw it in a different way, and I felt the pain. I'm like, damn, I don't want to do that anymore. I like this. I see why this is so much better, and I tell you what. Uh, it's Building software for over 21 years, I've seen it evolve from back in the day. Holy shit, you'd be like, they're going to build software this way? Where are all my tools? Like, yeah, I don't have tools. And now it's like, <laughs> shit, like, I remember when I when my first Ruby application, like getting this thing to run on a web server, like, holy shit, fast and GI, yes, that sucked. And now it's like, oh, I'm just going to do a few things and push and boom, there's your app. And it's like, it just, it's nice. I mean, it makes us go faster, but you also don't appreciate all the little things that are kind of building up this ease of your development process. To your point, like, I'll, I'll you know, s I'll have students and they'll get frustrated in the last moments before a project is due, and they'll be like, fucking Heroku, it doesn't work, it's broken all my stuff. And I will turn to them and say, you will never speak an ill word about Heroku. <laughs> you don't know what it was like in my day. Uh, the, the, when the, the times when you used to buy a server and mail it around and then send it to a data center like, no, I reject your disparagement of these tools and technologies. <laughs> um, yeah, the whole, the whole, uh, can you, uh, can you go like, re you know, cycle, power cycle my, uh, my, uh, computer there in the yeah. data center? <clears throat> or like, load the sites down because like, there's a power outage in that city right. or whatever. Yeah. Like, all these problems. Anyway, um, one well, last thing I wanted to highlight out of your, um, talk was the idea of trade-offs. You know, I think, uh, Katrina was talking about 
feedback being in context, trade-offs and like these software choices happen in, in a context. And I think that's one of the hardest things to understand in any time you are, whether you're new to a field or you feel like you're still early in your growth curve, if these things have the right answers, we would just pick them, right? But these solutions that you use for one client, for one company, for one scenario, are going to often be the wrong choice in, in the next one, right? And so it, it's frustrating and also empowering in a way that, as you say, like after 20 years, 21 years, like you're, you can still be learning new things because the context is constantly shifting. And it's not just a matter of like piling up all the right things I got before, but it's can I apply some of those right things in, in this new context, figure out what things used to be wrong are now right and what used to be right is now wrong. Hi, my name is Cody. Um, okay. You're talking about um, people processes are, are hard to fix and technical processes and projects don't fail for technical reasons, so on and so forth, right? Um, what would you say the best recourse is for an individual contributor, somebody who doesn't really have power over people processes, uh, in a situation where you can kind of tell those are failing, they're using wrong processes, they're, they're using wrong communication channels, whatever, um, but somebody who doesn't really have a, a way to affect the change within those? So, I mean, I guess the first thing is are you having one on ones with your team lead? You are. So, one yes. on one-on-ones are a great place to have these conversations. Uh, I recommend that you um, take more of the sort of data analytical approach to it. Like, here, if we did this, it would improve these things. It would allow us to do these things. So a very logical, rational approach to it as opposed to a very emotional one. Um, and I would just build that up. Like, build your case. Here's why I think we should do that. And, and, and put it forward and see what happens. Um, you could also lobby your fellow teammates and say, hey, let's, uh, let's talk to them in our one on ones about this. And like, you know, all just kind of get together and eventually be like, wow, everyone's talking about we should do this one process and we should change that. And so um, it kind of depends. I mean, I, I will tell you when in my first job, I actually was the CEO of you know, Indoor Policy. And I thought that meant that you could go into the CEO and talk to him about things. <laughs> he, he was very polite, he listened to me. You know, and nodded, and then nothing happened from anything that I told him. And I thought I had good reason, but I was also pretty young. And um, and I would say that just sort of temper your expectations about how fast any organization is going to make changes. But that's how you start it. And uh, I would also say that um, see if you can uh, suggest a little trial period, or like have this group give this a go and see how that goes and, and measure it and sort of track the results. Because then at that point, it's hard to argue with data. You have data on your side. And then they can say, okay, cool, yeah, that, that actually makes it uh, improvements. And you can say, like, I really like this adjustment in the process. And don't try to make it too big either, because if you make it too big, then there's too many things that can go wrong. And there's too many, the, the bigger the scarier it is, the more resistance the, the organization is going to push back on that. And for good reason, because if you try to change everything, a lot of stuff can go wrong. So I would say that's, that's what I would recommend is think about a small, incremental, very rational thing you can shift and see if they see if they might feel like a one over. To highlight a piece you said earlier, I think there's always a, a powerful role for this like peer leadership, right? And when the team lead or when the director says, hey, this is how we're gonna do things, we're gonna do a uh, code review on pull requests. You might think that's a great idea, but what everyone's gonna say is, no, we don't have time to fucking code review and pull requests. Can't believe they told us to do this, right? But when it comes from the peer and you say, like, hey, I'd love to do more code review and pull requests, people will be like, yeah, I'm in for that. That would be great. It's about time we looked at each other's stuff, right? And often it's the case that whatever you are feeling and on the verge of saying, other people are feeling and they're afraid of saying, right? So it is, I, I, I think, a a metric of leadership, or like perceiving the leadership that you're getting, is how receptive are they to that advocacy? And are they willing to listen is, is maybe a small step, and then they go, okay, great, yeah, thanks for your thoughts, see ya. Um, but second, of if you're willing to put yourself out, and uh, you know, I think it's important, Marty, that you, you titled it like taking lead, not like 
getting lead, receiving lead, being appointed lead, right? But to say, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be willing to step out a bit and try and make the place I, I want to be a part of, or try and make the process I want to be a part of, or make the team I want to be a part of. I think any good leader is not gonna feel threatened by that. And they're gonna try and like, amplify what you're doing, and it's a sign of bad leadership. Hey Marty, I'm Hi. DJ. Um, you you have the marketing fly reference, so I'm wondering, what point in your past would you now hire yourself? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, it depends on what I was expecting. So actually, I really love. Hiring people on potential. Um, if I feel I can put them into a place where they're going to thrive, they're going to be able to succeed. So um, I, uh, I mean, I think I did pretty well when I started programming. I, I, I got to program a little bit later in my career. So I was uh, in the army, and then I didn't tell you all this, but I was a musician, professional musician for a number of years. Did I do what you What was your army job? Uh, Mother Hotel, uh, and they take infantry. Anti-tank. So I, I just tow missiles. I shoot tow missiles at tanks. You're such a like lighthearted person, and I'm like, it's, it's like, oh yeah, also these love tanks. I, 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 was I, I was trained to kill, so and I actually was a soft gunner, so um, I had actually, I, I almost. This is another side of Marty, so you're seeing a softer, but I, um, I almost went special forces, uh, but. Problem was I had to reenlist for five years, and I decided that that Marty had a lot more potential outside of the military than inside the military. And as much as I enjoyed certain parts, I wanted to. So anyway, yes, I um, I can learn about the saw, play the saw, I can play all kinds of crazy things I didn't already. But um, so you hire that guy. Uh, <laughs> Army Marty was pretty raw. Pretty, I think. Uh, uh, Marty Marty need to have some some softening uh, before I would probably want Marty would probably be that that guy on the uh, on the team like I mean I had a good heart right I mean I was a good person inside but like Marty seriously like you're so insensitive or whatever like that was that was really hard it's it's very cringy um, and the, the people are like how do you really turn out nice this is we didn't really think very highly well, I'd say you're making progress I definitely making progress so I I think by the time I got to programming. I had had so many different life experiences that I was pretty hungry. I wanted to work in a team. I, I wanted to learn and grow. And so I quickly got, I took feedback in pretty quickly. And I learned pretty fast. But, so I think that I probably would have, uh, and for a junior role, of course. Um, I, think, I think about seven years. Year. 19. That would have been 97, 97. Um, So I think by about, this is interesting for me, about year seven is when it sort of switched where like, I had this confidence, like I think I could probably go in there. Before that, I was like, I don't know enough about computer programming and computer science to actually do some of these things. But I think at that point, I recognized I had enough experience and perspective, because I had like this non-technical look at the business side of like, or, like what problem we're really solving that was different from a lot of other programmers. And I was able to then use that to more effectively come to solutions. And I, I love just coming to solutions and work with people to find that. I didn't have any ego about like, I'm going to be the one that writes all the code and whatever. Like, I didn't care. I was like, what, what can we accomplish? What, what's your solution can we build together? And so I was, you know, that's like seven years in. I was at that point. At that point, that was like, yeah, I mean, I would have been a good, like, put him on a project and he'll work well with the team. But I, before that, uh, all right. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, thank you.